Let's do this. Let's do this. All right, here we go. This is the Big Bang. It wasn't an explosion, <laughs> okay? The Big Bang was not an explosion. The Big Bang, if you can picture it in your mind, it's impossible. But if you could, if we could put it onto paper, this is a diagram that tries to explain how the universe went from a smaller, hotter, denser state from right here. It's as far back as we, as we can see, right? This is how, how far back as we can see. We look through our telescopes, we go 13 billion years into the past, and all we see is this. This is the cosmic microwave background radiation. This is radiation emitted just after the Big Bang itself. And this is radiation that has since spread out into the universe and that we can look back and see. It's all around us, this radiation from the Big Bang. It's literally all around us. It's going through your house right now, right? Um, it's, it's a microwave radiation from the Big Bang. Now, any past anything past that, it gets kind of fuzzy, right? The universe becomes very hot, very dense. Our physics just doesn't work, right? Our physics just doesn't work. We don't understand what happened here past this. But about 13.8 billion years ago, we have an idea, right? The universe went from a hotter, denser state, and then it expanded rapidly. It expanded so quickly and so fast that space and time itself expanded, and everything kind of followed with it. And the universe became colder because the universe became, had more volume to it. It was colder on average. Right, So that's how all the stars and all the gas clouds precipitated from that early energy state. It was very, very like soup-like, right? Imagine very hot, dense particles, a soup of particles. They weren't really atoms yet. And then, but when the universe expanded, then atoms are able to cling together and become atoms and elements like hydrogen and helium and deuterium and a little bit of lithium. Um, that is how the first material happened. And since that, so after that period, the universe was mostly just hydrogen and gas. It was just gas. Um, and as the universe got colder and colder and expanded, stars were able to form. Okay. And then after that, galaxies. And then here we are today in the present day. Everybody keep tapping. Let's get some more peeps in here. Um, so right here is present day. Okay. And the universe is big. It's vast. And there's lots of stuff in it. Lots of galaxies. But in the past, the universe got increasingly smaller, smaller, hotter, hotter, denser, denser. Okay. And that's all we know. This is the entire picture of the universe we know of so far. Okay. Now you might be asking, Mike, how did stars form? Okay, what is what does a star mean? Well, remember, like I said, <clears throat> the early universe was full of gas clouds. Remember, like they look like this, just a bunch of gas. But what happens is, once these gas clouds, these gas clouds can clump together because of gravity. Right? There, imagine there's lots of gas in, in the universe. Over time, it wants to clump together due to gravity. It wants to clump together. Accrete. Right? And as these gas clouds clump together, they become disks. Be why? Because of angular momentum. So here's a good picture for it. Here's a, great, here's, here's a planetary disk. That forms due to all the gas in the universe. It clumps together, and guess what? It begins to spin because of angular momentum. That's what things tend to do. T things tend to spin because of gravity in space. Now, what happens if you spin like a cup with like 
imagine spinning a cup of coffee, right? What happens? Stuff tends to build in the center, right? Like a vortex. The same applies to stuff in space. The heat built up in the center of this planetary disk. And what happens is you have all that heat and stuff collect. It becomes a protostar. The early beginnings of a star. A young star, right? But how does a star continue? Well, a star is mostly made of gas. But it's so dense. It's dense enough to become plasma. An even more energetic form of gas, right? Just it's super particles. And because of this, because there's so much stuff and mass in the center of uh, the proto disk, the planetary disk, you have a star begin where these atoms, because of all that stuff being compressed, all that gravity compressing all that gas and plasma, you have lots of heat in the center of the star. Imagine millions of degrees, right? Millions of degrees. And because of this, because of this amazing condition, you have new, uh, stellar fusion begin, right? Where these atoms are moving so quickly at the center that they can smash into in together sometimes. And when the atoms smash together, they become larger atoms and then they yield off as well energy in the form of light. So that's how a star begins. That's how a star begins. All that energy and stuff all right, produces the first atoms and energy comes out of it as well in the form of light. So you have these two pressures, right? You have these two pressures fighting against each other. You have gravity wanting to push it inwards and then you have light and st stuff going outwards. And these two pressures become a hydrostatic equilibrium, right? And that's what makes a star stable. It goes into this equilibrium between pr the pressure of gravity keeping it inward and then the pressure of gas going outwards. That is how a star is stable, okay? So, how about the planets? Well, here we are back again. We have the planetary disk. Now, what happens is the star tends to want to send a shock wave out into space. And the shock wave pushes material outwards. And what happens? Stuff on the outside gets cold and it begins to form ice. All that gas and stuff begins to form ice. Water and all these things, right? They form ice. And that ice and rock, rocky material that precipitates on the outside of the planetary disk becomes the first planets. They clump together and they become the first planets. So let's have a good picture of this right here. Guys, keep liking, keep liking, keep liking. So look at this, the first planets, right? All that rocky material, the smaller rocks, the fragments and ice and all that stuff clumps together due to gravity. And in space, what happens is in space, um, rocks and metals are, are easily, they clump together more easily. It's called cold welding. Um, but the point is that you have all these rocky materials because of gravity, they dance together and they become the first planetesimals, the first planets, very hot cores, right? And that's what, from there, built up the bigger planets, okay? And that's how the Earth got there. The Earth is a big fucking rock, right? It's a big rock, and it's hot, it's molten. So in the early Earth's history, the Earth was very hot and molten-like. It was almost liquidy. It was so hot, right? Because of all the bombardment of all those fragments, all that activity in the early solar system, um, it even... And even those can collide together. Like you could have giant impacts. And this is how the moon formed, actually. The moon is a product of the, a, a giant impact that a planet the size of Mars hit the Earth and a lot of a chunk of the Earth spit out into space and became the moon. That's how the moon formed. It's amazing. This is amazing, right? The fact, and we've only, we realized this recently. After we went to the moon, uh, when we landed on the moon, we took back rocks and we sampled the rocks. And we discovered that it's literally the same stuff as Earth, the Earth's mantle. So, anyway, that's how the Earth and the other planets formed. It's amazing stuff. 
Okay? And now we have a planet where an atmosphere can form, right? You have other rocks smashing into it, giving water. A lot of a lot of these chondrites contain water, right? A lot of these rocks contain water in it and clay material um, and ice form. And when they hit the earth, it became an atmosphere, it became ocean, it became, and that's what became the, the leader of the oceans. Um, now, you also have in the center, again, remember, in the center of these big rocks, you have lots of heat buildup, a lot of pressure. And this pressure drives plate tectonics. The crust, so for example, all of the um, more dense material sunk to the core, right, because it's more dense, and the lighter material floated, right? It went up on top. That's typically what happens, right? The lighter, the less dense stuff rises. The same applies to the earth. The less dense materials, like your silicons and all these stuff, they rose and they became the earth's crust. The heavier materials like iron and nickel, right? All those things sank and became the earth's core. So now we have a crust on top of the earth with very hot molten lava beneath it. And this molten lava is pressurized and it wants to push on top of the surface and cause plate tectonics to happen. Um, you also have carbonate materials from the Earth's crust. Also, there's also water uh, in the form of clay materials on the Earth's crust causing water to form as well. You have many different sources of water and salt water, but the point is that we know how the water got here. It's because of these different things. And now we have a first rain cycle, right? Now we have that water, it, because of an atmosphere, it's able to, um, to, to evaporate and come back down to the gravity and form the first rain cycles. Now you have precipitation and clouds and oceans that were warm. Remember, the earth was relatively warm at this point. This is about 4.3 billion years ago. But, the beautiful thing about this is here's plate tectonics, which gave rise to the different uh, continents, right? This is what happens. That pressurized lava wants to push on top of the crust, and break it apart. Plates kind of move on the surface, right? On this liquidy surface, they kind of move around it. Sometimes they collide, sometimes they crash into each other and they cause faults, earthquakes. Volcanoes is, is that lava, that magma trying to go up to the surface, kind of like a, being stuck up by like a straw, for example. That's how volcanoes happen. And you have, now you have that kind of chemistry happening here, right? Where you have that hot stuff pushing up to the surface, causing smoke, right? Sulfur dioxide, carbon dioxide, all these different um, gases in the form of smoke now coming out into the atmosphere, enriching the atmosphere, enriching the surface even more. So think of all the chemistry happening here, right? Think of all the chemistry happening here. Now what's going to happen is eventually the oceans become habitable. The earth has a magnetic field because of the core, the, the, the movement, the motion of the, the iron core in the center causes the magnetic field to emerge. And now we, the earth is protected from uh, cosmic rays. And what this allowed was a great condition for life, right? The first life appeared about 4.2 billion years ago near hydrothermal vents under the surface in the oceans. And what you have is that hot water um, and the different chemistry happening. Um, the early Earth atmosphere contained things like ammonia, methane, and hydrogen gas which when combined in certain ways, they can form amino acids. The first building blocks of life can form inside of the Earth's atmosphere, as well as phosphoric acids and nucleobases. They form from gases. Um, sugars form from formaldehyde. So again, you have a very a habitable condition environment for for these chemicals to react with each other amino acids can form peptides longer chains of amino acids and these peptides can become polypeptides even longer chains and the longer the chain the more complex the molecule is a chemical evolution emerged and we have the first life
the first types of cells. Now imagine all the wetting cycles, the drying cycles, the sunlight on the surface, right? Mixing in with the, the chemistry from the from under, under the surface. These are lipid molecules that interact with each other, right? These are carbon-based atoms, carbon-based molecules that interact with each other. And because of the different polarities of these molecules, they can form a, something called a lipid bilayer, which is like a film, a filmy kind of thing, which in the oceans, it forms a spherical structure. And this is one of the first protocells. One of the first protocells. Again, this is how the first life emerged. Once these amino acids and, and, and more complex polypeptides meet with the protocells, you have the first uh, living things. Now, of course, we don't know. We don't have all the details. We don't have every single detail. I mean, there's much to learn here. But the point is that we have a good idea as to how the first life got here, how the first RNA got here, the first enzymes and, rib and proteins, right? They emerged from these amino acids and the chemical evolution. And here we go. 4.2 4 billion years ago, the first life. And once we have life emerge, once we have the first life, well, natural selection begins. Evolution begins. The survival of the fittest. Right? Um, this life was able to proliferate on the surface. They, uh, the first living organisms by the way, there was no oxygen on the surface yet, right? The surface of the earth was still very hot, very swampy, lots of ponds and, and very, very hot still. But what happened was the first, when the first bacteria emerged, some of the first living things were bacteria. And what happened was these bacteria were able to produce oxygen. They used, photo, they, they used photosynthesis. They used sunlight from the sun and they use carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and they produce their own sugars. A byproduct of that, these, these bacteria farts were oxygen. They fart out oxygen and it goes in the atmosphere, right? And this oxygen bubbles up from the oceans. Here it is. It's green, right? The first green living things. Um, because of uh, you know stuff in the in these uh, cells, the the outgassed this oxygen goes into the waters. It goes into the uh, it goes through the oceans into the onto the surface and in the atmosphere. And now we have the first blue skies. The first blue skies. Oxygen is now in the atmosphere, and this changed everything forever. Um, because now other living things could use the oxygen and that actually played a big role in our evolution. So now that we have, okay. So then we went from single cell organisms to more complex organisms. Everybody with me? <laughs> Come on guys. We got to get more people in here. This is pretty sad. Everybody keeps happening. Everybody keeps happening. Oh my gosh, I, I can't even I can't even read the comments. Oh my gosh. Okay. So here we go. Life. Life emerges. Right, and look at look at the journey it takes, right? This is amazing. Fish, reptiles, mammals, apes, human. And remember, this is four billion years of evolution in one picture, right? This is one picture of of the 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 way in which our ancestors became us. And remember, we have all these fossils. We understand very, very well what these animals were. We actually have, we can see them in the fossil records. But the point is that we went from very simple single-celled organisms to multicellular organisms to animals, the first animals about 800 million years ago. 
the first worm-like animals, the first insect-like animals, um, the first fish about 400 million years ago. And from those fish, they uh, had those fins became proto limbs. So were they able to? They were able to leave the oceans for a little bit, leave the ponds and lakes for a little bit, and go on to land, lay their eggs, and this became Tiktaalik, the first land animal. It was a fish-like species, but lived on land for some of its life. And from that, right as these fish went more and more onto land, they became amphibious. Right? They became more suited to the to the land environments. And they were able to use that oxygen in the air, breathe it, and from that moment, everything changed. Oxygen allowed us to become more complex. Um, you, you go from these amphibians to reptiles, the first reptiles about 330 million years ago. And from those, from those reptiles, dinosaurs emerged. Right, that's a different branch, but some of the reptiles became mammals over time. About 260 million years ago, the first mammals emerged. They developed milk glands, hairy skin, things like that. Those mammals became um, those 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 first primitive animals became the first rodent-like species about uh, 170 million years ago. Right, they look they resembled squirrel-like species. Um, and then about 90 million years ago, the first monkey-like species. They weren't monkeys yet, but they were very, they were proto-monkeys. And then from there, 65 million years ago, everybody knows what happened, right? The big asteroid impact. It wiped out the dinosaurs. And this made way for our uh, ape, uh, our, our primate ancestors to emerge. About, seven, uh, about 55, 50 million years ago, the first monkeys emerged. And after the first monkeys, apes branched out from them the first apes about 30 million years ago, Proconsul, and then um, chimpanzee-like species, Artipithecus, the first humans about 4 million years ago, right? Australopithecus afarensis, and the first human species about 2 million years ago. Remember, humans are only 2 million years old. And from there, Neanderthals, they, we, we developed fire, we... we our brains, our brains became larger. We, we developed fire. We developed languages, agriculture about 20, 15 million, 15,000 years ago. And here we are today. Humans. Modern humans who have societies. And we live in cities. And we have farming. And we have agriculture. And we have medicine. And this allowed us to become who we are today. Right? And look at the journey though. Look at the journey that we took. Four billion years of small changes that became who we are today and again every picture you see here is millions of years right there's billions of small genetic changes in between each of these steps that makes us who we are that that made each species the way they are that's how evolution works so when you think of evolution you have to think of like a tree Right? Think of an ever-growing thread of changes, small changes. That's what evolution means. Right? From the first life, they branched out. Different species, different populations split. They went different places. They each found themselves under different evolutionary pressures. And they became different species over many, many generations. And from that, they branched out. Right? Look at this amazing tree of life. All the species of life exist here on this map. Bacteria, eukaryotes, which are more complex organisms, more complex single cell organisms, plants, fungi, protosomes, insects-like species, fish species, amphibians, reptiles, birds, and then mammals right here. And then here we are humans at the very end. But again, Every species shares common ancestry. If we trace back all these branches of the tree, imagine a, a big tree. If we trace back all the branches, you go back to one moment right here, three point uh, four point two billion years ago, where all life came from. Again, all life shares ancestry with these cells, these single-celled organisms, about four billion years ago. 
You can trace back all life. Even us and trees share common ancestry about uh, 2 billion years ago. If you go far back enough, you find that we share ancestry with every living thing. Even bacteria, even fish, even monkeys, even lions, whales, every species, birds, every species you see around you, we share DNA with. Because you can trace us all back to that one origin 4 billion years ago on the earth. This is remarkable stuff. This is amazing stuff. And it's, it's a fact. Evolution is a fact. We can really observe this and we can really see this. It really happens. And um, that is amazing to understand, right? So just th this is why evolution is such a, a hard thing to grasp because this is, you have, to, you have to understand all the different small changes in order to understand how evolution works. You have to understand the tree of life. You have to understand the tree of life to understand evolution. If you don't understand that, you'll never get it, right? It's not like Pokemon where you go from one thing to another. You don't morph, right? It's, it's, it's a tree of life that always branches out. Um, and by the way, so, so when we say, you know, when we say humans come from monkeys, what we mean is we share common ancestry, right? So think of that big tree of life. About 10 million years ago, these are all the apes of today, right? These are bonobos, chimps, humans, gorillas, orangutans. They, these are all humans. Um, but if you look at our DNA, if you look at our fossils, you realize that we actually share common ancestry about 10 million years ago. In other words, 10 million years ago, there was an ancestor that all of us share and we branched out from, right? So about 10 million years ago, there was an ape that one spe one branch branched out and became orangutans. Another branch kept going and became gorillas. Another branch went and became bonobos and other chimps. And then one one of those one of those branches around here five million years ago, where us and chimps share ancestry, well, one of these populations split and went and became humans. That is what we mean by common ancestry. It means we share ancestors about six million years ago, and from this moment we branched out. And from this, in this, this is about five million years of evolution from the first human-like species to the first humans of today. Remember, there were many human species before us. We're not the only ones. There were many human species. Paranthropus. Well, these are not humans, but these are the, those human-like species about six million years ago. This is the this is the ones we where we we branched out from the chimps. Where right at. This is the species at the six million year mark, right? Where I just pointed out here, right here. That's the species, right? Um, Australopithecus afarensis comes a little bit after that, about four million years ago. And this is really, this is Lucy, right? This is when, this is the last common ancestor. And that's the pinpoint as to where we branched out. And from there, we became Homo habilis. This is a species... This is the first human species right here, Homo habilis. They walked upright. They, they, they had to leave the trees of Africa, right? For the longest time, our ancestors lived in trees or near trees. But for the first time with humans, we left the trees. We started to migrate across Africa from Central Africa to Northern Africa. And then we migrated into Europe. So here's other human species. These are all different human species. Erectus, about 2 million years ago. These are the guys who first discovered fire. Um, um, Heidelbergensis, another human species, about uh, 500,000 years ago. Georgicus, Homo georgicus, another human species, about uh, 80,000 80, years ago. Neanderthals, 70,000 years ago. Neanderthals had larger skulls. They had larger brains than we did. Did you guys know that Neanderthals had larger brains than us? They had the biggest brains of all species. But that doesn't necessarily mean they were smarter than us, but it means that there was some evolutionary reason as to why their brains grew. 
ours did not grow as large. But again, we were living, we were living at the same time as them. Again, there was a time where we, at Homo sapiens, were living with other species of humans, Neanderthals. But what happened was, for some reason, they went extinct about ten, to, uh, about uh, fifty thousand years ago, perhaps because of an ice age, perhaps we outcompeted them, perhaps there was disease. Who knows? It's a mystery still today. But they went extinct, and we lived on, and we became. Homo sapiens sapiens, who have agriculture, right? We have the first civilizations. We migrated. Um, so we migrated out of, again, this is, this isn't set in stone, but th we have a very good understanding of how we think um, we migrated out of Africa. So if you guys can see here, Humans, origi humans originated here, near Kenya, modern-day Kenya, about uh, 2 million years ago. But since then, we had many migrations out of Africa. See, you can see, I don't know if you guys can see this, but this is like 160,000 years ago. We migrated into Eurasia, into Europe, where there were Neanderthals here living with us, and Denisovians here as well in, in Asia. Again, many different human species migrated, had different patterns. But the point is that we left Africa, we left into different climates, and this forced our species to be different. We had to, we had to adapt to the conditions, the cold, the weather, the environments, the food sources were different, right? We had to use our brains. That's why we're smart as humans, because we adapted to the conditions that we were placed in, right? Um, and we happened to survive because we outsmarted our environment, and now we're here today. But from there, from Asia, we migrated. Actually, there was a very, there was a, a land bridge here because about um, twenty thousand years ago, this was all ice. So humans were actually able to migrate out of Asia into North America about fifteen thousand years ago, and from there we we went into uh, 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 modern modern day United States, Central America, and South America, where the first Mayans emerged, right? The first Mayans were able to develop agriculture and became the first modern civilization. But that is a very amazing story to understand. This is amazing to, to comprehend. And, and we've, 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 underst we've just understood this for the past hundred years. This is all amazing information that we've just recently discovered. And it took thousands of scientists from all across different subjects and fields to come together and give us this amazing understanding of, re of what really happened. That's why, uh, why science is amazing, because it gives us amazing insights on our past and our perhaps future. Um, another great example of evolution is whales. Whales were not always in the waters. In fact, whales are mammals. Why is that? Why are whales mammals? It doesn't make sense, right? If you think God did it, right? Why would God do that? Why would God make mammals whales? Well, the reason why is not because God did it, but because whales emerged from the land. Whale ancestors were land animals with four legs called Pachycetus. And we have these fossils. See, we have the fossils. These are, these are whale ancestors about 60 million, million years ago near modern-day Pakistan. That's why it's called Pakasitas, by the way. Well, we found these fossils in the geological strata, and it showed us this slow progression of species becoming more aquatic over time. Arms and legs became more webbed. They were fitted towards more aquatic environments. They went into the waters. Perhaps there were predators in the waters. Perhaps there was more fish to eat or there was more stuff to do in the waters. Uh, perhaps that's where they had children or something to escape predators, perhaps. And this forced them into the waters. And what happened was they slowly but surely became whales. They're over millions, again, remember, over millions of years and thousands of generations. Their arms slowly became fin-like, which allowed them to become whales and 
by the way, whales breathe air like we do. Whales don't breathe underwater. They have to go up. <laughs> they have to go up into the air and breathe just like we do. Whales can't breathe underwater. Like, well, just like, well, fish don't necessarily breathe underwater either. They, they do, but they take oxygen from the, from the water. But the point is that they have lungs, right? They, whales actually have lungs like we do. They have to breathe air. Um, they also uh, give birth, uh, not through eggs like fish, but like we do through a placenta. The, the point is that what explains why whales are mammals is because they emerged from land animals, land mammals, about 65 million years ago. Amazing stuff that we've just understood. So... There you go. That's our. That's the story of evolution. And do you guys have any questions? So far, thank you for the gifts. Thank you. How often do they come into the air? For I believe it's like I don't know. That's a good question. Let me find out. I believe it's like hours or something. I don't know. Yeah, 60 minutes. So the average whale can hold its breath for about 60 minutes. Some whales for about 90 minutes or two hours. So so whales can breathe, can have to hold their breath for two hours underwater. And they have, that's why they have to go up and uh, breathe. Um, but that's amazing. Their their no their noses became on their snouts became moved upwards on their. We can see this in the fossil record. They went upwards into their skull and became their breath holes, <clears throat> blow holes. So that's amazing stuff, guys. Um, but now we're gonna now we're gonna talk about the scale of the universe. This is always fascinating to understand. But. There we are. There's a human being. Smiling face. Now let's zoom out. Let's zoom out. Let's see what else is out there, right? I know we, we know a lot about Earth. Let's find out what's out there in space. Let's look up and see what happens. All right. Zoom out. Okay, there's a city. There's our... Tri-state area. There's San Francisco. There's Apple, Silicon Valley. Right now, we we become little dots, barely noticeable. There's some states. There's the United States. There's Canada. There's Mexico, and there's the Earth. Right, this little blue place, like in a sea of darkness, <laughs> a sea of darkness. Right, that's that's all we are on this little planet. Right, that's an interesting perspective. But let's zoom out even more. Let's see what else is out there. Oh, there's the moon. Okay, it's orbiting the Earth. There's some asteroids that are f f flying by us. They're flying by us all the time. And there's Mars. Mars is just outside of us. There's Venus. It's closer to the sun. Mercury, even closer to the sun. There's the sun. There's the asteroid belt, there's Jupiter, there's Saturn, Neptune. That's all the major planets we know of. There's Voyager spacecraft. We have some probes that we sent out from NASA. Voyager and New Horizons, which are very far away. Here's the, Now we're reaching the outer edges of the solar system. The Oort cloud, which is a bunch of gas and dust left over from the early universe from the early solar system lots of icy stuff lots of comets now we're reaching out beyond the solar system other stars and now our star our sun becomes a little another just another star right it becomes another little dot and now we have all the closer stars near us vega these are stars you can see with your naked eye here's some clusters of stars oh here we are the milky way galaxy here's the milky way galaxy 
that's where we are. We're over here in this, the outskirts of our galaxy, the outer arm, spiral arm. If you notice, the galaxy spins like this. It rotates just like the solar system. And every one of these dots is a star. Every one of these little bright dots is a star. Every one of those pixels, right? So in our galaxy, there's about um, 200, 300 billion stars, each with their own planets. But let's zoom out even further than that. Now, each of these become galaxies. Each of these dots not, are not just stars. Now they're entire galaxies, each with other billions of stars in them. Look at this. Now we be now our entire galaxy becomes another dot. <laughs> wow. Now if we zoom out even more, we reach something called the cosmic web. This is the outer edges of our understanding of the modern observable universe. Every one of these dots is a galaxy. And there's trillions of galaxies, at least as far as we can see. There, there could be even more out there. In fact, many scientists think that there's 500 to 1,000 times more galaxies than we observe. But what we observe is about 2, 3 trillion galaxies in the observable universe. That's the cosmic web. Fascinating stuff. Look at how small and utterly dwarfed we are compared to the vastness of, of the universe. And this is just, you know, a dozen billion light years across. Who knows what else is out there? What a humbling perspective. But let's zoom back in and see what else we can find. Okay. There's a galaxy. Here we are. Let's find our star. Okay, reaching our star system, there's a sun, just another star, and our earth, just another planet, another rock with stuff on it. <laughs> All right, now we're here, humans. We're back to square one. Wait a minute, let's zoom in. Let's see what else is inside. Okay, there's the eye, there's a pupil. Wait a minute, there's even more here. There's a smaller universe inside of us. We're zooming into the eye. Now we see blood vessels, these tiny blood vessels that we can barely see with the naked eye. And now we can see the individual cells moving in our blood, blood cells. That's what blood is. Blood is just a bunch of cells moving throughout your vessels, which give oxygen to your body. Here's an individual cell and each one of your cells contains chromosomes, which are different pairs of DNA. This is what makes up who you are. Each one of your cells contains DNA, which gives the instructions as to who you are. It tells you what genes you have or your everything about you. But let's zoom, let's zoom in even more to an individual DNA molecule. And a DNA molecule is a strand of millions of smaller molecules and atoms. That's all a DNA molecule is, right? It's a big strand of a bunch of molecules. Polymers, right? It's, an, it's a, a specific structure that allows it to replicate. That's what DNA is. Amazing stuff on the chemical level. It's amazing stuff. And now we're going into atoms, okay? Here's an oxygen atom, right? That's what your, that's what your DNA is made of, carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, nitrogen. And inside of atoms are electrons, electrons orbiting around a nucleus. A lot of emptiness in the atom, but inside of it is a nucleus. A nucleus contains neutrons and protons, other particles, small particles. Even deeper inside of them are quarks. Quarks make up neutrons and protons, and their, their atomic energy, the motion of these particles, produces an atom at the very fundamental level. This is the end of particle physics. This is the most we can see about particles and what they are. So you've just seen, now we zoom out back and into the macro world, there's an entire universe inside of you. 
right? There's an entire, not only is there a world out there, but there's a world inside of us, an entire universe, which with lots of stuff to learn about. Look how amazing this is. Look at how amazing this perspective is. There's so much to learn. Fascinating, right? Amazing. And um, all of that learned was understood through here. This little earth. That's us. That's us, right? If you guys can see it, it's a little dot right there. Right? There's our planet. That's our planet right there. That's the earth. Right? Look at how much there is to understand and learn about the universe. There's so much we don't know yet, right? There's so many things. We know. That's amazing to me. That makes me happy. <laughs> it, it, it makes me happy to know that there's so much mystery out there. There's so many things waiting to be uncovered and discovered. That makes me utterly happy and just fills me with excitement. And the fact that that's all we are, that one dot, but look at what we can do. Look at what we are, right? Look at what we are. It's amazing. Um, we are humans. We do. We, yes, we are molecules. But look at what these molecules can do. They can think. They can experience. They can be conscious. They can understand this. That itself is amazing to me. And makes me happy to be alive. <laughs> right? Like that just makes me like excited. I just want to like, yes, this is amazing. So exactly. It's not even 50% of what we know out there. Exactly. There's who knows how much we don't know. And that's fascinating. Um, and uh, here, here are some amazing photos of space that we've seen from the James Webb telescope. You know, all around the universe, we see lots of stuff, just amazing stuff to look at. Here's a supernova, right? Stars can explode. And that's really what we are made of, right? Like I said, if it, when we say we're made of stardust, that's what we mean, metaphorically speaking. Every one of your atoms, oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, all these atoms are recycled stuff from stars, right? Because in the cores of stars, like I said before, these atoms are produced in these stars. And when they explode like this, this is a real photo of a supernova explosion, a star that exploded. And all of its gas, all that stuff, all that oxygen, all those atoms, those elements went out into space. And then they collapsed again and became another star. So all the heavy elements that we know today are recycled star stuff. Everything that makes up your body, the iron in your blood, the calcium in your teeth, right? The phosphorus in your DNA. All of that, all those atoms come from this stuff from space that explode, got into space and become us eventually through a series of all those events we just, we just went through today evolution and chemistry and physics of star formation and that's amazing right here's another beautiful picture of a uh, nebula the, what this is it's not an explosion but a very silent death this at the center of this is a star a white dwarf that died it's it stopped producing light because there wasn't enough energy to do so anymore. There wasn't enough stuff or gravity or mass to make it happen anymore. So the star slowly faded away, like a light bulb dimming out slowly. But the gas was still there. A lot of the gas that was still present eventually got stripped away out into space. And it got sent out like this in rings. So you can see this ring nebula happen and this beautiful structure. And all these different colors are different elements. Um, I don't know exactly the color coordination, but I believe the reds are like iron. Um, 
I think the yellows are like sulfur. But the, the point is that all those different colors correspond to different elements from stars. And they go out into space and make these amazing things, structures that we call nebulas. And we can see from thousands of light years away. Here's another one. And, and by the way, this is how our sun will die. Our sun will not explode in a supernova. It's too small. But it will die in a, as a white dwarf. And all of its elements will be stripped away into space. Here's another amazing photo from the James Webb. And each one of these galaxies is a, is a, each one of these light things is, a, is an entire galaxy. And if you look closely, you'll see like these little like bands, you see these little like lines, these curved lines. And these are actual real stuff. It's an, it's, well, it's real in the sense that this is a real photo, but the reason why it's long, it's stretched out like that is because there's a lot of stuff in between us and galaxies that are millions of light years away, right? These, these galaxies, some of them are billions of light years away. And in this space, because space is so vast and because there's a lot of stuff in between us and the galaxies, there's a lot of black holes, black holes that you can't see directly, but they warp space and they warp time and they warp light. So as light comes passing through, from these galaxies, they reach a black hole and that light gets warped. It gets distorted by that gravity. And this is called gravitational lensing. So when we see these galaxies, when, these, when we see the light from these galaxies with a telescope, we see these bands, we see these lines, these stretch marks. That's amazing. So when we, when we see these stretch marks, that means that there's something there that we can't see that's affecting the light. That's that's stretching the light. And here's a stellar nursery. This is where stars are born. These are the these are the gas clouds that we talked about from the beginning. In space, there's gas clouds that many many stars collect. Right, many stars can be produced. And you have a nursery, like young baby stars, right, being nursed into existence through gravity. There's clumps of material here. The more dense clumps yield stars. And you can see here there's little bright lights there. These are the beginnings of stars. You're looking at some of the first years of a star. This is how we got here. Here's a closer image of the Orion, one of the most amazing, beautiful photos ever, in, in my view. But you can see here that this is a very zoomed in photo, but you can see the little dots here. These are all stars, clumps of stars. There's hundreds of them being born. Remember, these are light years away, though. Um, but the point is that space is so vast and, and these gas clouds are so large that you can have stellar nurseries bring about many stars. That's amazing. So here's a debris disk. Here's a real photo of an early star system, right? Remember the, the, from the early, from the beginning of the, of the, to talk today, I talked about those protoplanetary disks. This is it. This is one of them. Early star, Gas and dusk, a ring around it. This is where planets are being formed, right in front of your eyes. Planets being formed right here. <laughs> That's amazing that we can see this. You know? And for the longest time, our ancestors look out, looked out into space, right? And they, they didn't know what any of this stuff was. Right? Just, just think of the, the privilege that we have today. Think of the privilege we have today to be able to see all this stuff and understand all this stuff. Our ancestors look up at the sky and they saw the, star, the sun. They didn't even know what the sun was. They thought it was some kind of mystical being. Now we know it's just a star. It's just another star. 
They looked up and they saw Venus. They thought it was a star. Now we know it's another planet. It's a hot planet. They saw all this, all this stuff out there in space and they didn't know what it was. They saw all the stars. They thought there were lamps. <laughs> they thought the sky was a dome. They didn't know about space. They didn't know about outer space. But for the first time in human history, we now know what is out there to a very much more greater degree. And that's amazing. I, that's why I never take science for granted. Because we know so much today. And it is so useful and so important to understand this. Remember, all this stuff helped us learn about medicine, biology, right? Physics, all this stuff to help us to get the phones you have. Science actually works. It's amazing and it works. It gets us stuff. It gets us technology. And it's fascinating. I don't know how you couldn't be fascinated by this, you know? Um... It just, just maybe, it just makes me happy to, to learn. All right, so what are your, some of your questions? What do you got? What are your questions? Did you guys like that? Explain dimensions. <laughs> well, dimensions are just mathematical constructs, right? You can imagine space as, imagine a square, right? A square is a, a two-dimensional object. But when we imagine space, we imagine three dimensions, X, Y, Z, up, down, like length, width, and height. That's space. That's one dimension of space, 3D space. Um. Now, if you imagine a fourth dimension to that, you add another dimension to that, you get a four-dimensional space-time. You want to add another dimension? That's five dimensions, right? This is it's a mathematical construct to understand what space and time is. That's all it is. Do you think the sun will engulf the earth? Yes. When our sun dies, what will happen is it will exhaust all of its carbon in its core. The sun will never produce anything larger than carbon. Maybe a little bit of remnants elements larger than that, but not much more. And as the carbon gets fused or the, the uh, helium gets fused, it will become larger. It will become brighter and larger. Well, not brighter, but it'll become larger. And then it will collapse slowly and then burn out into a white dwarf. It will, but as it, as it uh, gets larger, become, it'll become a red giant, which will engulf the earth. The earth will slowly become hotter and hotter. About two, three billion years from now, the earth will become hotter, too hot for anything to survive. And uh, it will completely engulf us, maybe even Mars. Probably not Mars, but probably the Earth. But then it will collapse again into a white dwarf and then become forever cold and dark. And uh, that's how the sun will go. Do you think there were billions of Big Bangs like firecrackers that created the galaxies? Well, no. The Big Bang refers to the entire universe. Galaxies, galaxy formation is still not very well understood, but um, it's not it's not a mystery as to probably how it happened, you know, gas clouds, things like that. But it's still a big mystery. How did energy come into existence? Well, energy didn't necessarily come into existence. Energy could have always existed in some primordial form. So at the Big Bang, as far back as we can see, the energy and matter that makes us up today was still there. Um, in fact, you are part of the Big Bang. But if you go back in time, you'll find that all the matter and energy was, was in this weird state 
called the quark gluon plasma. It wasn't gas. It was even more energetic than gas. In fact, it was so energetic that all of the, all of the forces of nature, the gravity, magnetic force, the weak force, all these forces, the atomic forces, were all clumped into one, into something called the supersymmetry. It was a very weird, liquidy, gooey, soupy state that we just don't comprehend yet. But that's as far back as we can see that our energy and matter was in that primordial uh, state. But since then, the universe expanded and all that stuff, all that energy and matter was able to become colder and became modern day atoms. And that's what we are. We are the remnants, the, we are the precipitants of that early primordial state. Is there a planet like Earth? Yeah, there's billions of planets like Earth out there. We know that there's 5,000 exoplanets beyond our planet, beyond our star system. There's 5,000 planets. A lot of them are like Jupiter-sized planets. We can see them. We know they're there. And a lot of them are Earth-sized planets, perhaps some of them with water. In fact, we've detected water on planets outside of our star system. There could be life there. But beyond that, there's likely billions of Earth-like planets that we have not discovered yet. The reason why is because there's so many stars and about 15 to 20% of stars likely have planets orbiting around them. And you do the math, right? If there's 400 billion stars and uh, if 20% of them have, have planets on them and a fraction of those have Earth-like planets, you're going to get billions of Earth-like planets. Do you think it's possible to time travel to the past? No, um, not in any sense that we can understand. Um, the problem with space time is that you can't travel faster than your time cone, your light cone. Uh, see, you can't travel faster than light. In order for you to go back in time, you, have to, you would have to travel faster than light. It's not possible for us to do. We can't travel past our light cones. However, there might be a loophole to that in something called a wormhole, where if you rip apart space and time, if you go through it, perhaps, you might go through another dimension, and on the other side is another hole that you can escape out of into another place in space-time. So perhaps if you understand physics enough, you can go through a wormhole and go to another time in the universe. It's possible. It's amazing. It's possible though. It's just hard to do. <laughs> we don't know if it's if it's actually doable, but it's possible hypothetically. But that's our only hope, I think. Why do we seek meaning in existence? Well, we want to, well, we're egotistical. We evolved to be this way. And there's nothing wrong with that. Um, see, we look for meaning because we want to be meaningful ourselves. We want to be meaningful, right? We want to be liked. We want to be loved. We want to be cared about, right? It's so uncomfortable to think that nobody cares about you, right? That... That nothing matters. Right? That's uncomfortable for us. It's so much better to think that someone out there cares, that there's somebody out there looking for you, who cares about you and what you do, right? And is going to take care of you and guide you. And look at how egotistical that is. And look at how much it, it seems to align with the general picture of a god. It's because we evolved to be liked we want to be liked we want to fit in right and this is seen with all the other animals right all the other animals want to do this because that's how they survive they they live close together and they want to be liked um it's just social things it's just social development why do we evolve chemistry right evolution is a genetic 
thing. It's a genetic process. See, there, your, your DNA is made of genes, and these genes uh, can be changed. Why? Because when your cells replicate, right, in the process of DNA replication, what happens is genes can get misplaced, right? Remember, you have thousands of genes in your DNA. Sometimes some proteins get mismatched, some genes get misplaced, there's insertions where they don't belong, there's deletions, right? There's all kinds of mutations that happen in our DNA, in our genes. And when you give when these mutations happen, so they're rare, but when they happen and these genes proliferate, well, guess what? They're going to be given off to our offspring and they're going to inherit those genes and be different genetically, albeit very small. The point is that it's a, a purely chemical process that we understand very well. It happens in our DNA. DNA is proof of evolution. But the fact that there's flaws in our DNA means we are here today. If there wasn't those flaws, we wouldn't, we wouldn't be here. Did we have fins at first? That's actually a great thing to say. So there's something in evolution called, there's something about evolution called homologous structures. And it's incredible to think about, but when we look at our when we look at our uh, our skeletons, we find that fish have the precursors to arms. Um, if we look at our arms, here's a great picture. One second. If we analyze the, the if we analyze the, the 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 fins of a fish, look at this. If we color code all their all their fossil structures, I'm sorry. If we color code our structures of our skeletons, we find of our bones, we find that fish have certain bones and all in common, right? The, their fins contain these bones inside of them: the red ones, the yellow ones, and the blue ones. And this is Tiktaalik. This is one of the first land animals right here. They still had fins. And um, if you see in this species of fish, they have these finger-like uh, bones. And if you look at human arms, now let's look at the human arms, right? Here it is. The same color-coded bones. The same bones. The one red, the two yellow, and the finger bones. Look at that. The hand bones right there. They're all similar. Now, of course, there's a lot of changes in between these two. But the point is, like, of course, structurally speaking, these fossils got longer, right? They became different in size and shape. But the structure remained. The precursors to the human arm are found in fish. They're found in fish. The same fossils, the same bones are found in fish. This is direct proof that we evolved from fish-like species. This is just one of them. But that's a great question. What would happen if time travel was doable and we did make it happen? Well, Stephen Hawking pondered about this. In fact, about 20 years ago, Stephen Hawking hosted a party, a time travel party, where he didn't give anybody invitations. In fact, the invitations he sent out after the party. This way, if somebody went to his party, he knew that they'd time traveled to get there. But nobody showed up. So he suspected that if time travel existed, where are they? Where are the time travelers? Why aren't they here? And there's many responses to this. Either it's not possible to time travel to the past. Or maybe they're hiding and they don't want to show themselves. Or maybe it is possible, but 
you know, they're maybe it's it's not possible to go back to where we are today. You know, maybe it's possible, but just not to where we are now. We don't know, but that's a very good question. Um, we don't know if time travel to the past is possible or not, but nothing stops it. The, the nothing eliminates it from the realm of possibilities in science. It's just not clear. Okay. Um, what other questions you guys have? What is a supernova? A supernova is an explosion of a star. A star that exploded. See, stars that are big, a lot of stars are... A lot of stars out there in the universe are larger than our sun. In fact, most are. Some are so big, they're 10 or even 20 times the size of our sun. And when you have that kind of mass, right, all that gravity, when you have all that stuff, all that mass and gravity, as there's, there's so much pressure inside of the core of a star that... When um, it collapses, when it blows up, when it when it enlarges and then collapses on itself, when it stops fusion, when iron, when it meets iron in the core, it stops. It can't fuse iron anymore, right? So it stops. It stops fusing it. It succumbs to gravity and it collapses very rapidly, and then it explodes under its own weight, and. And then goes out into space, right? All that stuff goes out into space. Such a violent explosion because these stars are massive, super massive. Um, that's what a supernova is. Our sun will never explode violently. It will enlarge in, but when it collapses, it won't explode. It will slowly dim out in a white, as a white dwarf. Some stars, when they collapse, they become black holes. Some stars are so large that when they collapse, they become black holes. In fact, that's how most black holes form. They're stellar black holes. Um, but many, it depends on the size of the star. It depends on the luminosity. It depends on all many different factors contribute to if the star explodes or becomes a black hole or not. But that's how a star happens. A supernova happens. Can you have science without God? <laughs> yes, science is different than religion. Science is after facts and evidence. Religion is after feelings and fantasy. There's nothing wrong with fantasy. But if you take it too far, it can be a problem. After a sun explodes, how does another star form? Well, after the star explodes, all that gas and dust goes out into space. And then over time, it slowly coalesces together again and collapses due to gravity, right? Gravity wants to attract things together. And that gravity is always there. It's, so it's, a, it's something about space and time itself where you have, if you have mass, you have gravity. So wherever there's mass, over time, it's going to collapse again and become a, a creation, and become a planetary disk again and become another star. Um, it recycles again, like I said from the, like I said before, it's a recycling of matter. That's what we are. We are, in fact, we are the remnants of stars that exploded billions of years ago. Perhaps multiple different stars. Remember, the universe is fourteen billion years old, so there could have been two or even three, even four, different cycles of stars before us. So we could tr we could possibly trace back our stuff, our atoms, to dozens of stars in the past, and that's amazing. Why do you assume it was a big bang? Was there like gunpowder involved? No. So the big bang. 
so the universe, it wasn't an explosion. The Big Bang was an expansion of space and time, and it happened everywhere. The Big Bang happened where you're standing. In fact, the Big Bang is still happening today. The universe is still expanding. It's just that we don't see it on a local level because gravity overcomes the expansion force of the universe. The expansion applies to space and time, but gravity is powerful enough as there's enough mass to overcome that expansion force. However, that's how the, the Big Bang happened. It's a rapid inflation, like inflating, imagine inflating a balloon. All points of it expand at the same time, the same with space and time. All points of space and time expanding are expanding. And we are being chugged along, along with space and time through the expansion of the universe. So the Big Bang is still happening today. It's not an explosion. It's just an e expansion. Think of it like a stretching, right? Like stretching a space, like a rubber band stretching. That, again, it's very hard to conceive of four-dimensionally. It's not possible. But if you can imagine it, don't imagine like an explosion. Imagine it like a stretching. And the next question you're going to ask, well, what is it stretching into, right? This is a great question. The answer is itself. If the universe is everything, there is nothing beyond it. There's nothing beyond it, which means that it is expanding into itself. Space and time itself is expanding. It's not moving into another space. It's expanding into itself. Very difficult to comprehend, but that's what we think. That's what scientists think. Thank you for the heart. Thoughts on aliens? <laughs> well, there there are more stars in the universe, as you've seen, than grains of sand on all the beaches of the earth combined. So, given the sheer number of planets out there, life is inevitable. But, at the same time, life is rare in terms of the number of life forms out there probably because life has to undergo certain conditions to evolve. Um, it has to undergo certain conditions to arise in the first place. Like we saw on earth, right? The earth had good conditions for life. Mars potentially had life. Venus potentially had life. Um, so we know that there's good candidates in one solar system Depending on you know your calculations, there could be millions of aliens out there. But the point is that if we know how life got here, we can we can speculate about other life out there. And I think that life is very common out there. Black holes could make a universe. Well, not black holes, but perhaps white holes. So a, a, a white hole is the reverse of a black hole. A black hole is something where you have an object that's very dense and, and massive, or not even an object. It's really more like a, like a kink in space-time where there's a lot of – it's a dense object where stuff goes towards the singularity, right? Stuff gets sucked in. Into, single, into a singularity at the bottom. <clears throat> a white hole is the exact opposite. It's stuff from a singularity being pushed outwards into space. So perhaps that's what the Big Bang was. Perhaps the Big Bang is a white hole where singularity, there's an, the outside of it is a singularity and, and we are on the the in the insides of the white hole being expanded away from the singularity again speculation we don't know but it's possible it's possible <laughs> will the sun eventually die out yes the sun will die 
in about 5 billion years, our sun will... See, what's, what happens in the sun, the reason why the sun is burning is not because of fire. The sun isn't fire. It's plasma. Very different. In the sun, there are atoms inside of the core and its mantle that are being uh, smashed together due to the immense pressures producing light. Light is pushed outwards, keeping the star afloat. So when these atoms run out, when the atoms become too large in the core for them to um, fuse together, well, the energy is going to run out. The light's going to run out. And eventually, the sun will slowly dim away and become cold and dark. It will run out of energy to burn. And that will happen in about 5 billion years now. We can calculate it. We can calculate exactly when this will happen. Um... And it's about 5 billion years. But before then, we will burn away as the sun gets larger and larger, as it burns at its last stuff, its last energy. The sun will enlarge and will, and will engulf the earth. We will go away. We will vaporize. And what will be left is a white dwarf, a very small, cold star. The moon is getting away further from the earth. Will, the, will this affect us? Will that affect it first? Oh, yes. So the moon is slowly but surely moving away from us about two inches per year. So every year, the moon gets two inches away further from us. In fact, when the dinosaurs were around, the, the moon was much closer. It was much larger. When the earth formed, it was very close. The moon was perhaps twice as close as it is today. But because of the uh, disturbances in the, earth, in the moon's orbit around us, it, will, it is slowly moving away from us, and gravitationally speaking. And that will happen. It will, it, it, there will be a point in time, I believe in a couple hundred million years, maybe um, half a billion years, where the moon is so far away, it will not, it will no longer be part of our orbit. It will drift away from us. That will happen before the sun dies. But we are living in a time where the moon is observable to us. We're living in amazing times today. Amazing times. Do you think there are more humans out there in the universe? <laughs> Well, it's possible, but again, looking back at our history, there are so many factors that had to happen for us to be here today. So many that I don't know if it's likely that we'll find another species like us, exactly like us. Even in the vast universe, there's probably nobody like us, in my, in my opinion. That makes us special, guys. We are special. Because we are this way. Now, of course, every species is special. Every species is special. But, but look, but, but the the, the, there's a chance that we might be the only type of humans in the universe. The ones like us. That's amazing to, to think about. Now, of course, there'd be, there'd be, there could be all kinds of amazing intelligent aliens out there that are more advanced than us. But I think that in terms of our species, I think that we are very rare, if not the only ones. But then again, if the universe is infinite, well, then of course we exist out there somewhere else. If the universe goes on forever, it's inevitable that you're going to reach another planet like Earth, exactly like us, in something called the parallel universe. It's possible that if there is an infinite realm of possible universes, there's one where we exist, but there's something different, a little bit different about us. We are, maybe in that universe, I'm a billionaire. Maybe in another universe, I'm a Christian. Maybe in another universe, it's not TikTok, but block block, or <laughs> blick block. <laughs> there, if the, in other words, based on mathematics, if the universe is infinite, there's an infinite number of possibilities. 
And that's amazing to ponder about too. There's, there's so much we don't know. Which planet has the strongest magnetic field? Well, the sun does by far, but it's not a planet. Uh, but the earth, the earth has one of the strongest magnetic fields. Maybe Jupiter does. Let me, I don't even think it's Jupiter though. Strongest magnetic field planet. Yep, Jupiter. It is Jupiter. But the Earth's is close. The Earth is very close. But because Jupiter is so big, right? There's so much stuff and pressure in the core. In fact, we think that there is an iron core in the center of, the, of Jupiter. It's, it's this weird liquidy state. Um, it's called liquid metallic hydrogen uh, not iron by the way not iron uh, metallic hydrogen which is a weird form of hydrogen um, but yeah hmm good question what is the most sustainable planet to go to feed yourself Earth. <laughs> Mars is the second. It, it, the, the next closest planet to us is Mars by far. Mars is the next habitable planet. It has a 24 hour day. It has ice caps. It even has water on its surface. It's a little too. It's icy water, but water nonetheless. In fact, you can grow plants on the Martian surface if there's a dome surrounding it, yes. Plus water, you have to get you have to bring organics and water to it to get rid of the perchlorates. But you can grow plants on the Martian regolith, the Martian dirt. It's possible. Um, Mars is very livable if we have the right tools. How large can black holes get? Black holes. There's a black hole in the center of our galaxy. There's a supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy. It, it's the size of maybe a thousand light years across, but it has the mass of millions of stars. It's, it's, it's super, it's super massive. Um, but they can get very large. They can get, I don't know exactly how big they can be, but. Um, I would assume that it could be uh, as long as very, very large. Light bends. Could light from the Earth's past be visible in a night sky? No. Um, you would have to have... I mean, I guess it's possible that the, the, you can somehow capture light, but I don't know. There would have to be a black hole that's very near us, which would probably engulf us. And it has to be right, it has, and it would have to be configured in the right way for that to happen. Do you think the universe can die? That's a big question. I don't know. I don't know. You know, when we say die, we typically mean it stops functioning. But the universe may always exist in some way. Can you time travel through a black hole? Well, it's not time travel. It's it's time dilation. We know that if you go, if you go near a black hole, time slows down. The faster you move through space, the slower time travels for you. It's called time dilation. And this is a real phenomenon. The closer you get to a black hole, the more gravity you get you get close to, the slower time passes for you. In in fact, we can measure this. If we if I saw somebody near a black hole from the earth, I was looking through a telescope, I would see them actually slow down in time. They would be in slow motion 
from my perspective, relatively speaking, they will be in slow motion as they near a black hole because time space is warped so, space time is warped so much near a black hole that relatively speaking they would have to traverse more space per their movement per their motion so from our perspective it would seem like they're in slow motion but they're actually to them they're they're actually regular right but to us they'd be slow motion this is what happens this is why time is relative in the universe my now moment is different than what you call now Everybody's everybody's moment in time is different. And this is a weird phenomenon, but it's called time dilation. Now, in terms of time travel through a black hole, um, in, in, we don't know if, if it's possible to pass a black hole. But we know, we, we think that at the center of a black hole, time stops. Time stops passing. Relatively speaking, right? If I was, so if from the earth, from the earth, looking at a black hole, time doesn't exist. There is no time. It's just static. And that is weird. But again, we black holes are very mysterious. Um, spooky stuff happens when you travel fast through space. Um, would you personally move to Mars if given the chance? No. Way too cold there. <laughs> Way too cold. Um, why do humans have such a short lifespan compared to some other mammals? Um, well, we actually have very long lifespans, relative, to, relatively speaking, to other mammals. Um, it's, it's, if anything, it's the reptiles who have longer lifespans, or amphibians. Turtles, for example, have very long lifespans because they have different regulatory systems. They have different uh, genetics. Um, but mammals typically have, um, are warm blooded. They typically move a lot more. They typically have more, um, they, they mate more often. That's why they're able to have shorter lifespans, but other species like reptiles, they don't, they have different ways of, um, they have different genetics, especially epigenetics. Jellyfish, some jellyfish in the oceans are immortal because they can make they can synthesize their own new completely new cells they almost never age but they typically die from predators and things like that what happens to time near black hole event horizon slows down time becomes becomes fuzzy um event horizon is the outer edge of a black hole where gas and dust is spinning around it very superheated plasma and um, that's the edge of black hole where time and even light itself begins to warp inside of it. Um, but yeah, time would slow down for you because of the immense gravity that you're experiencing. Um, and again, if you go inside of it, well, you would die, but you'd also, but time would actually stop for you. Relatively speaking, again, time is relative. This is so hard to understand. Even I don't understand it fully. But, but just think of a time not being that, like, w when you imagine the universe, don't, um, you can't imagine one time for all the universe. That's not how time works. There isn't one time, you know, um, time depends on your velocity, depends on your mass, your gravity, your co your coordinates within space. Many factors tell us what dictate what time is. Or what time you experience. And think about like this. Um, if I'm in a plane, well, here's a mo here's here's a very simple idea to understand relative motion. Somebody on a plane is moving at six hundred six hundred miles an hour right on the plane relative to me they're moving 600 miles an hour but if somebody had a tennis ball in the plane sitting sitting down imagine somebody sitting on a plane with a tennis ball in their hand throwing a tennis ball up and down well that tennis ball is not moving to, to the person in the plane it's not moving 600 miles an hour it's moving one mile per hour right up and down on their hand 
But to me, that tennis ball is moving 600 miles an hour. Relatively speaking, to someone like me on the surface of the earth, that that ball in the plane is moving 600 miles an hour, right? So that's how time and motion works. And this is how Einstein pictured 4D space. He pictured it like that, where there's this one fabric that we exist in. We're embedded in this fabric. And what we observe, the motions we see, the time we observe is all relatively sp- relative to where you are, how you observe things. And that's incredible. Did time exist before the Big Bang, before the universe? Um, we don't know. Um, Stephen Hawking came up with a no boundary proposal where he said that there's nothing beyond the Big Bang. There is no boundary. There's no time before the Big Bang. Um, but there is many other hypotheses that came out after that. Um, there's many ideas, right? There's there's all kinds of multiverse hypotheses and uh, cyclic cosmology where Big Bang after Big Bang, right? Big Bang and then a big crunch, a big bang again, or, or a continuous Big Bang that reaches a certain threshold and expands again. Uh, th- there's all kinds of different hypotheses. But all we know is that we see a universe that was smaller, hotter, and denser 14 billion years ago. And that's all we can see. Okay. Um, well, guys, I got to go. Hope you enjoyed the lesson today. Um, I will post this on TikTok for to, uh, on YouTube for tomorrow. By the way, everybody go follow my YouTube. Follow my YouTube. Everybody go link in bio. Follow my YouTube. Who learned something today? Whose mind was ex- whose mind was blown today? <laughs> whose mind was blown? Just keep learning, keep learning, keep learning. You know, the universe is amazing. And um, now you understand more about why I do what I do. Because I love the universe and I want to share that with people. Um, And the more I learn, the more I appreciate, the more I learn about the universe, the more I appreciate it. The more I learn about people, the more I appreciate people. The more I learn about animals, the more I appreciate animals. Learning gives you a perspective on life that is undescribable. So keep learning, right? That's all I'm here for. I want you to learn and think. It's amazing. <laughs> you didn't come from monkeys? Go wa- go rewatch this on YouTube and go learn why we're not monkeys and we don't come from monkeys we share ancestry with them how were atoms made atoms are made of atoms are made of more simpler subatomic particles like protons and neutrons and those are made of quarks if you notice that the in the early universe there was a quark gluon plasma right very soup like dense state of energy and matter and they were kind of, think of it like a free, like all these particles were freely moving around. But as the universe expanded and it got colder, what it means to be colder is there's less emotion. There's less atomic motion. So what happened was as the universe expanded, these particles were able to cling on to another, right? They were able to interact with each other. And because of this, the protons and neutrons connected, they interacted, they became nuclei. Electrons are able to begin orbiting around these nuclei and become atoms. That's what an atom is. An atom is electron orbital around nuclei. And those particles, those subatomic particles, come from that quark gluon plasma from the early universe. That's how atoms form. Um, the larger elements came after 
uh, uh, still uh, Big Bang nucleosynthesis, and then stellar fusion. If the universe were infinite, how would that reconcile with the inflation period? Um, infinite in what way? So, yes, that's a good question. This is what Alan Guth proposed with his inflationary model, right? What he proposed was eternal inflation, where there was a past finite time where the universe was smaller, hotter, and denser, then expands and eternally expands in the in the future direction. Um, so he figured that, hey, you can't go, if you go past, if you go back to the past, you're, get, you're going to get to a point where there's a finite beginning, which might be the case. And using his model, we came up with, 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 uh, with quantum mechanics, we come up with a scalar field where there's multiple quantum fluctuations all happening in a larger landscape where big bangs happen all the time. And these big bangs can yield inflationary universes like ours. Right? That's literally what we could be in. We could be, our entire universe could be in a sea of other Big Bangs that we can't observe. They're beyond our horizon. Um, by the way, there's, a, there's an event horizon for the universe, by the way. It's creepy. It's so creepy. But there's a point in the universe where it's completely black because we can't see. Because... The universe is expanding faster than light can reach us. There's a point in the universe where the universe is expanding faster than light. So in that sense, light will never reach our eyes from that place, that region of the universe. That's scary. And by the way, that event horizon is getting larger and larger by the day. So <laughs> there will be a time where we will see nothing but darkness, where things will be so far away from us that their light will never be able to reach us again. There will be a point in our universe's future where, from our perspective, blackness will ensue the entire universe, observably speaking. And that's creepy, but amazing. That we live in this moment where we can see galaxies, where we can see lots of stuff still. We are in a prime, we're in a very interesting moment in the universe where we can observe and learn all these things. Let's not take it for granted. So anyway, how do we know it's expanding? Well, we can measure the redshifting of galaxies. <clears throat> Last things and I'll go because I got to go. I'm tired. My brain is hurting. Um... When galaxies, so light stretches through space and time. Light is a wave, right? And there's different frequencies of light. And these are called wavelengths, right? There's infrared, that's a longer wavelength. There's, there's a visible that we can see. There's x-rays, which are shorter wavelengths, more powerful light. But the point is that as space, as this light moves through space, it, it stretches with the stretching of the universe. And this is something we observe. Red light tends to be longer than blue light. And if you can observe red light in the universe, you know that that's expansion. That's a stretching of the light. So when we observe galaxies with telescopes, we see the light coming from them. It's redder. It's red shifted. Which means one thing that they're moving away from us, that they're expanding away from us. And we see this with almost every galaxy we see, with the exception of Andromeda and other galaxies that are close to us. By the way, Andromeda galaxies are going to collide with us. But we observe the shifting of this light, the stretching of the light with the space-time stretching. And that's, re that's called ref the red shifting of galaxies. We also see the cosmic microwave background radiation that's microwave radiation that we now see today because it's stretched from a more uh, likely uv radiation or visible radiation or um probably x-ray radiation from the early universe had a since expanded into a microwave form microwaves are some of the longest forms of radiation and 
that's how we know the universe is expanding. Plus, there's many other reasons, but those are the, the main two. Okay. Um, is there an update for finding life on Europa? <laughs> well, we, we won't know until we send out more probes, which are coming soon. We will... D don't I suspect that within our lifetimes we will find life on other moons in our stars in our solar system. I think that we will find life on Enceladus. It's my opinion, but I think that in the next ten twenty years we will find life. Definitive evidence of life. Um, and if we find life, that will change the world. It will change how we see life itself. Enceladus is a great candidate for life. One of the best candidates for life. Even better than Europa. Because Enceladus has the right time frame for life to occur. It has the right ingredients. It has water. It has salt water. It has phosphates. It has amino acids. It has energy sources. And Enceladus is the best candidate. What causes gravity? Well, gravity... We don't understand it. The funniest thing about the funniest, the craziest fact about science is that we don't know what gravity is, right? The, the one thing that is so intuitive to us, right? That this will fall. We still don't know why this happens. We don't know the how. We know what ha We know that the bottle will fall. We know gravity exists, but we don't know exactly what it is yet. But Einstein, uh, Newton thought that there was an attractive force that that invisible force that pulled on things. Now we know that's incorrect. That's not accurate. Einstein came along and discovered that it's not that there's an invisible force that's attracting the bottle to the earth, but that there's a warping of space and time itself that the bottle follows. The ge they're called geodesics. This bottle is following the geodesics, the curved geodes geodesics of the Earth through the curvature of space and time. That's gravity in, I in an Einsteinian view. Um, again, this is very difficult to conceptualize, but the point is that gravity seems to be the warping of the fabric of space time. And every object you see is just simply following the curved geodesics of space time. Again, everything in the universe is, is moving through space-time at the speed of light. It's just that some things are moving faster through space than time. See, your motion through space is in four dimensions. Some of your motion is through time, some of your, some of your motion is through, through space. In our case, most of our motion is in uh, time. We're very st almost static. We're, just, we're, we're on the earth, which is spinning, but we're, most of our motion is through time. In the form of light, all of its motion is in the... In, the reason why light... The, the reason why you can't travel faster than light is because all of time's motion is in the dimension of space. And it has no room to go to, to, to have motion in time again this is very difficult to comprehend but the point is that that space and time is a four-dimensional construct that that very weird not intuitive to us so anyway i gotta go Do I believe in manifesting? Let's see. Million dollars, a million dollars in my hand, a million dollars in my hand. No, nope, didn't work. Um, okay, I gotta go, guys. Have a good day. And enjoy. I'll be back tomorrow. <laughs> Maybe if I'm if I'm up for it. We'll see. Keep learning, keep questioning, stay curious.